up the slack. <laughs> Everything we need to get tonight, oh, we'll get it. <laughs> but every praise is due our God. Woo. Somebody say, count your blessings. You can name them one by one, baby. You start counting them, you really will see what the Lord has done. Amen? All right, well, i tell you what, why don't you turn around and shake hands with somebody? Smile real big. Thank you all. Well, every praise. <laughs> I said every praise. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> Do I God. Praise the Lord. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. Tony Irby. I'm the Senior Associate Pastor of Education and Discipleship here on the mountain. And if you, nobody's told you yet, let me be the first to not only welcome you, but to say thank you for coming and being a part of us on tonight. This is a place known, uh, we say it all the time, where love is known as king around here. This is the place right here. And I hope and trust that you sense that already. Praise the Lord. Uh, if we have any first-time visitors, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I just want to let you know uh, that we certainly appreciate you being here and, and worshiping with us tonight, um, learning with us on tonight. Lots of places you could be, but you chose to be with us, and for that we are truly grateful. We believe that your steps are ordered of the Lord, and, uh, and, and because of that, you're in the right place at the right time. Let's give all of our visitors a hand, if you will, all of our guests here on the mountain. I would say that if you're visiting here, if you'd be so kind at the end of, of this service here, if you would go out to our main lobby and kiosk one, we have people there smiling, good-looking folk <laughs> that want to greet you, uh, want to put a, a packet of information that will give you uh, tell you more about our church, tell you more about our ministries, other programs and services that you can avail yourself to. They also want to put a gift in your hand, and who doesn't like a gift? That's a good reason to go out there and say, where's my gift he told me I could have? So <laughs> go on out there and get that, uh, uh, and uh, you'll be glad that you did. Let's also welcome our uh, internet audience, all of our online lookers. God bless you. We want to let you know on behalf of Pastor George and Terry Pearsons that uh, we want to thank you for logging on, choosing to worship with us tonight, choosing to learn with us, and choosing to grow together with us. Know that we, con we ex consider you uh, our extended family and that we are always uh, thinking about you, we're praying for you, and know that we do love you. Let's give them another big hand if you would. <laughs> Amen. Folk from all over the world. What do we need to do now? How about welcome just everybody? Here, here, there, and everywhere. <laughs> welcome to Believers Institute tonight. Amen? We, we are celebrating, in case you didn't know, we're celebrating 10 years of Believers Institute here. Ten, a decade. Let's give our own selves a hand. Amen. And you know what we've been doing as we celebrate this 10th year? We've been putting the Word of God first. Amen? making it final authority in our lives. We're bringing it back home. Amen? Amen. So tonight will be no different. We kicked off our Believers Institute on last week. How many of you were here for Word First with Pastor Terry? That was Believers Institute kickoff. Look at all those hands. Were you blessed? Yes. I know you were. <laughs> and uh, it seemed like every night I'd go back to get some CDs just for me. I'm like, it's Believers Institute. I want to capture some of this. They sold out. <laughs> so I know you all didn't just enjoy it on uh, Sunday through Wednesday night, but you'll continue to feast on that word of the Lord. Our pastors are in Russia now, and uh, on their, if they're not there, they're on their way, getting closer anyway. And uh, so continue to keep them in prayer, and I uh, believe that they'll have a mighty move of God over there. All right? Well, we're going to continue tonight with uh, the, putting the word first, and we're going to hone in specifically on the integrity of God's word. The integrity of God's word is what we're going to uh, focus in on tonight. And we have a panel, distinguished panel of folk. We'll introduce them later. They're going to just take us to the next level as it relates to the word first. And you might say, why are we continuing on that same thing? I mean, we had four days of it, you know. <laughs> why? Because the word is first, amen. 
and uh, I could be a smart aleck and say, why not? You know? <laughs> I, w- <laughs> I won't do that, but I will, say <laughs> I will say this, and that is putting the word first and the integrity of the word, that is a, uh, uh, it marks us and who we are. Amen? Amen. It's, it's, uh, uh, um, it's one of those priorities as it relates to this company, this band of believers. Amen? Amen. So I consider the word first and the integrity of the word really a a, a defining characteristic of who we are. Amen. A distinguishing characteristic. So that's really why we're doing what we're doing. And it's not over. Uh, As you can see on the slide, tonight is our panel discussion. And uh, next week we will have breakout classes still on the theme of the word first. And we'll come together, just like we are now, but we will break out into various classes all throughout uh, the sanctuary, our modulars, every room, available room probably. Um, We'll have some of y'all in them, okay? We'll give you the plan for how they're going to be divided out on next week, but you got to come back next week because we're going to take it not just from Pastor Terry's level to now a smaller group of of panelists that's going to share some things, but we'll have individual classes, and not only will the instructors be sharing Uh, uh, taking it to another place, but guess what? Because we're in a small class, you get to participate, amen? I know you got something to say, don't you, about putting the Word of God first, about the integrity of the Word? Well, you have opportunity in a small group, and that's one of the things that I like uh, about the breakout classes, that whole idea is it's that opportunity to make a large church feel small, amen? So make sure that you're back next week, and then the final week, October 2nd, I believe it is, Pastor Terry should be back, And uh, we're going to pull on her to close us out on the word first. Amen? Amen. So uh, that's kind of the the session one. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about session two. I'm not going to tell you very much, but I will say this, just as a side note. This coming Sunday, as it relates to session two, uh, which is September 22nd, this Sunday, registration starts for the second term. Okay? So make sure that you uh, go out in the lobby this coming Sunday and you can register either there in person, they'll have computers there, you can do it online, and we'll also open up our online, uh, um, you can go to emic.org beginning September 22nd, and you can register online for the, not the classes, but the uh, group that you wanna be in for a second session, all right? And if you did not get one of these little babies here, (laughs) this is our catalog, this will give you more information about Uh, Believers Institute, not just the first term, but the second term as well. That's one way you can connect us. And if you didn't get one, they'll be out at Kiosk 2, I believe it is, our information station. If you go out there, you can get one of these, and that will help you. There's another way, real cool way, that you can also keep abreast on what's going on as it relates to not only Believers Institute second term, but uh, events like Word uh, Word First, uh, other guest speakers, and events that we'll have going on. And that is... How? By signing up for text message notifications. How about that? We're getting up with the 21st century, (laughs) y'all. Text message notifications. And uh, um, so if you'd like to sign up for text notifications here, find out what's going on at the church, stay connected. Um, Just visit the front page of emic.org on that rotator deal they have on that. It'll tell you exactly how you can sign up for text messages from EMIC. So make sure you do that, all right? That'll be kind of cool to do. How about it? And uh, another one other announcement, and that is as relates, how many of you know Mylon and Christy Lefebvre? How many of you know them? All right. Without God, I could do nothing. <laughs> I think that is song. <laughs> anyway, Mylon and uh, Christy Lefebvre, they'll be on Life Today with James and Betty Robinson on this coming Tuesday, uh, 924, the 24th of September at uh, 7 p.m. This is a live studio audience, which means what? You can go if you go to lifetoday.org, lifetoday.org, and there'll be instructions on how you can purchase. Uh, it's not even a purchase. It's actually free, but how you can uh, acquire your, your ticket or your pass so that you can be in that studio audience on uh, this coming Tuesday night to hear the ministry of Mylon and Christy Lefebvre. All right? And I thought that was all my announcements, but I have one more. Did you all notice the beautiful playground equipment going up out here? Progress is promise, baby. We get, we're getting it together. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I saw them out there 
uh, uh, sweating like hogs out there putting, that stuff, putting, <laughs> putting those swings and all that stuff up. But let me say this, um, they are in the process of putting it up, which means what? Putting it together, which means it's not time for little kitties to get up on it yet, all right? <laughs> Let us give you the word to say that it's up and complete and safe. There you go. That's the word I'm looking for, safe. So um, anyway, admire it going up, but please, if you have young children or grandchildren or whoever, um, please don't let them uh, start getting on it until you get a word from up here that, um, uh, that it's ready for uh, fun, okay? All right, well, let me ask you this question. How about giving? Are you ready to give? I said, are you ready to give? All right. Well, I'd ask that you go ahead and get your offerings out, and I'll share just a little bit one of my favorite scriptures as it relates to uh, giving, and that is found in Luke, the sixth chapter, and the 38th verse. Uh, in Luke, the sixth chapter, and the 38th verse, it reads, give and give it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. With the same measure that ye meet, uh, with all it shall be measured to you again. That's Luke 6, uh, 38. And I like that top part of that, that give and it shall be given to you. Lots of us like it to be given to us. We like to be on that receiving end. I mean, am I right about it? <laughs> you know, but you know, uh, um, that would be great. And I like to be on that end too. It shall be given unto you, except for those first two words. Give and. <laughs> give and. And you know what? I didn't make that up or I didn't say that. Those are the very words that came straight from the mouth of Jesus himself. So we can count on it, amen? If we do our part, because we all like the, the, on the receiving, the being given to part, but if we do our part and give, then we can expect a harvest on our giving, amen? And, uh, and we should expect a harvest on our giving. God wants us to be blessed, and he set up that process for us. He wants us to, to uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, he wants us to be uh, prepared to require no aid, uh, uh, ourselves and to be furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. Amen. That's the place we want to be. That's the place that's been promised to us, but it's not just going to be given to us to be that way. It's only going to be given to us to be that way as we give. Amen. That's God's system. And that is a cycle. You know, the world is so Every time you hear of a cycle, normally it's a negative way. It's this vicious cycle of this. You know, it's always made to, but this is a positive cycle. This is a victorious cycle that goes up because what? As you give, then it's given to you, which means what? You can give more and more is given, which means you can give more. So this cycle is a good cycle, baby. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, uh, um, just remember that, that if you want to keep the blessings of God flowing in your life, uh, if you want to, to be in that position where you can be on the giving end when things come up, I can handle that. I, let me take care of that. Uh, and it happens all the time here. So you should say it happens to me too. It happens all the time. You know, I have the benefit of being, uh, you know, on the senior leadership team. So we hear all the time, oh, somebody was able to give this. And somebody was able to give this many thousand dollars. And I'm like, wow. Somebody was able to give this many thousand dollars. A hundred thousand dollars. I'm like, wow, man, you know, I want to be in that line, but I won't just get in that line by wanting to be in it. How am I going to get in it? How are you going to get it? By doing what? All right. yeah, I think you got the lesson, huh? All right. Well, go ahead and uh, if you have your checks, you can go ahead and get those ready. I'm going to ask if our ushers would get ready to come. Uh, if you need an envelope, there should be one on the seat directly in front of you. If perchance you're on the front row in there, uh, if you just raise your hands, we have ushers. Uh, Brother Aaron and some others that will make sure that you get uh, an envelope for your giving. If you're giving online, you can click on giving, the giving tab, and it'll give you instructions so that you'll be able to uh, follow through and, and give online as well. Are we ready? Yes. All right. Why don't we just hold up our offering? Praise God. 
Amen. And if you don't have one, just raise your hand up. I have mine. I just don't have it with me. But just raise your hand up. You know, and I remember the days when we believed this scripture, this so strongly that people, if you didn't have money, you'd borrow them. Give me a nickel. Give me a dime to put in. I want to be in on this giving in. I don't have that. A pencil. Any, all kind of stuff be coming in the offer. I'm not suggesting you do that, but I'm just saying. But I, but I am saying that but that was the way, that's how much it meant to us, how serious we were about giving. So let's just pray and we'll receive our offering. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for all these tithers, all these givers, all these that are obedient to your word. We're talking about putting the word first. Well, that means putting the word first in every area. So we're putting the word first as it relates to our giving. And because we're putting the word first, because we are honoring you, we can expect a harvest. And with that harvest, we'll not only give you glory for it, but we will be in a position and we will be obedient as you lead to give again so that we can receive again, so that we can give again, so we can make that uh, what could be a vicious cycle a victorious cycle, Father God. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Ushers, are you ready? Singer, are you ready? All right. <laughs> speaking, if you listen <laughs> with your spiritual ear, if you look with your spiritual eyes, the word of God will speak. He'll lead, he'll guide. The Bible says his word is what like a, a light to my path. It's a lamp to my feet. Amen? 
Praise the Lord. Well, I'm going to ask you. Well, I don't have to ask. They're already out. <laughs> How about if our panelists would come on out? <laughs> yeah. Well, these are a group of folk here that uh, Believers Institute instructors, all of them now, most of them have, have taught before, and uh, so they willingly uh, said they step up to the plate and share on the integrity of the Word of God. A couple of them at gunpoint, but, you know, no. no. <laughs> But uh, at any rate, uh, what I'd like to do at this time is, is to introduce a young man that's going to facilitate this portion uh, of the class tonight. And uh, you know him as the post-service internet host. <laughs> How's that for a title? The post-service internet host. And, uh, but more than that, uh, um, he has the opportunity, the, the pleasure and the privilege to minister to e-members, those of you watching, e-members, partners, uh, members from all over, uh, not only the United States, but really all over the world, you have opportunity to minister. In fact, while you're on vacation, I got a, someone from Canada uh, was wanting information, and you know, and I'm like, when's Jeremy coming back? <laughs> 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 you know, <laughs> so I can give this to him. But uh, at any rate, he has the privilege and honor to do that, and I, he works with me. It's a pleasure to have him on my team, and uh, I'm going to ask if he come forth, he's going to facilitate the panel and the rest of the service for tonight. Give uh, Jeremy a hand as he comes. Thank, Thank you, you, Jeremy. Well, truly, I have the pleasure and honor of working with a wonderful panel this evening. And I know that we have a great evening in store for you. As Dr. Tony said, we are focusing on word first, but more specifically, the integrity of the word tonight. And so, as you see, we have a group of six people and uh, each one of these people were selected because they have a very specific perspective and they're going to share that with us tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Jaime Hernandez to come down. Jaime was born and raised in Puerto Rico. He was saved as a teenager uh, in a church youth service with evangelist Nikki Cruz. Some of you may remember that name, praise God. Uh, Jaime joined the U.S. Air Force in 1986 and served for 24 and a half years. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let's give him a hand. Praise God. Jaime has been married for 27 years to his wife, Bildette, who is sitting right over here. They have two adult children, Jonathan and Candy, and Jaime is also on staff here at KCM, and you are helping us develop our Spanish ministry. Amen. Praise God. Well, brother, without further ado, Thank you. take over. Appreciate it. Praise the Lord. Wow, well, what an honor. It's really a, a privilege and an honor to, to be here sharing the Word of God. And uh, I don't want to take any more longer time than I'm supposed to. we got a pretty tight schedule. And, uh, but you know, it's really hard to uh, compress Brother Copeland. <laughs> so, uh, so bear with me. I, I am going to share with you today uh, on the integrity of the Word of God. I, I'm supposed to introduce this first part of the teaching, and uh, it, it's really something difficult to do because the, the richness of what is there. But uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to say that uh, integrity is a word that sometimes gets convoluted in different meanings and stuff like that. And I did a little bit of research before I came here, and I, and I went to the dictionary, and I found out what integrity means in the dictionary, and it basically, it's related to character, to a person's character, to moral character. That's one of the first things you find in the dictionary that talks about integrity. And when you, when you go that route and you start thinking about the, the morality of, of the things of God, you know God is one. And his word is very specific about uh, who we are and what, who are we to, and how are we to behave or conduct our lives. But there's another meaning in, in that word integrity. And this word, we get the word, the mathematical word integer, integer. Remember that? An integer means simply whole. And what I want to say with that is this, the word of God is whole. It's one. And there are three things that I'm going to share with you very quickly. Uh, the first one is God and his word are one. God, from the beginning, everything that God has done, everything that God has said, 
always works the way he says it's going to work. And we see that in Genesis, correct? Yeah. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he said. And every time he said, that happened. Exactly that, no more, but no less. So when he said something, his word is so, such a, a, a has so much integrity that it does exactly what he says he's going to do. So the first thing that we need to think about when we think about the word of God is that every time, every time God speaks, he means what he says, and that's what is going to happen. So today, when you, when you brought your offering before the Lord and you were saying, Lord, I'm bringing this offering according to your word, and I believe that I receive such and such. His word said it. There's integrity in his word. That's exactly what's going to happen. Amen? Amen? So God and his word are one. And that's the thing that we need to remember every time. Every time. Not sometimes, not 50% or 60% or 30%, every time God's word goes out, it's whole. And, it, and it, it, whatever he says happens, that's what's going to happen. Amen? Amen? The second thing I want to share with you is that God releases his faith every time he speaks. God releases his faith every time he speaks. That word contains faith one of the things that Brother Copeland says in the tape is that the way the earth was formed, the way the earth was, came to be, was because God said it. And everything that we see right now, everything that surrounds us, contains faith. Faith is holding everything together. When I was thinking about this fact, I thought about the atoms. You know how the atoms are formed and they have orbits and all this other stuff? What's keeping it together? And you really start thinking about it. And the scientists are trying to figure out, you know, the God particle and whatever. Well, the God particle is faith. Faith sustains everything. And every time God speaks, because his word is, has such integrity, every time he speaks, every time happens what he says is going to happen. And every time he speaks, faith is released. And faith is a force. It's a force that will take care of things that need to be take, you know, broken apart. But it's a force that always will keep things together that need to be kept together. And the, the reason we can see, you know, we have these seats and we can sit and we can stand and all these, you know, material things. What is sustaining that, really, when you think about it? Faith is. Because God released his word, and everything that is created was created by faith. Hebrews tells us that. Hebrews 11.3. Right? Amen. It says that everything that is created was created by faith. Amen? Amen? So that's point number two. And you know what? As believers, we have the ability to do the same. Amen. God created us in such a way that we have the ability to also function in faith every time. Yes. Not sometimes, but every time. Why do you think the enemy fought so hard to kind of reprogram us to say, for example, uh, I'm dying laughing. You've heard people say that? Dying laughing? But you know, the scripture doesn't say that anywhere. In fact, it says the completely opposite. It says that the joy of the Lord is strength. Amen? And when you have a glad attitude in your heart, what comes is life, not death. And when you, when you laugh and you enjoy yourself, what's coming is life, not death. But because of the enemy and the traditions of man, we've learned to say all those other things. But we don't think about it. You know why? Because if you don't think about it, you don't put faith behind it. And you speak words without faith. And God, in, in the scripture, tells us, that there are words that are void. Have you heard of that in the scripture? It tells you that avoid words that are void, that have nothing in it. And many times because of our culture, we are speaking words devoid of faith. But God speaks. When God speaks, every time faith is released. So if we speak the word, if we speak the word of God, then we release faith every time we speak. Amen? Amen. 
How, how many would like to live that way their lives? I mean, every time you speak, every time you say something, faith is released. The third thing that I wanted to share with you is it's very similar to what I'm saying is that words are containers. You've heard that, right? If you've heard that teaching from Brother Copeland, it's really easy to grasp the concept. It's like a bucket, you know? If you, if you have nothing in your bucket and you go like this, nothing's going to happen. But if you put water in it, Jeremy will be wet. <laughs> Amen? So words carry, the thing about words is that they can carry either positive force or negative force. And the way that I could grasp or put my brain around it is that positive force is light, is the light of God. And when you speak words that are full of faith, they're full of light. And light comes and enlightens your life and it changes, it changes everything. And you've been, you've been to a dark room, right? And, and you can't see nothing. When you turn the light on, everything changes. The perspective changes, everything changes. Amen? So we have the ability, just as God, that every time we speak, we can release faith. Amen? So that's, we have to train ourselves to do that. And when we catch ourselves saying something that is devoid of faith, then we have to train ourselves with the Word of God. Why? Because the Word of God is always the same. Amen? Now, I want, to, I want to share with you a very short testimony of what the Word of God can do when you put it to practice, because it always works the same way every time. The, the integrity of the Word of God says that this is the way it works. Amen? Amen. And in my life, what happened was that uh, Jeremy shared that I joined a service in 86. But before that, I lived in Puerto Rico. I, I grew up there. And, and in Puerto Rico, uh, English is not one of the main languages. It's taught in schools and all that. But I did not speak English when I was in school. And it was never used. So when I decided, <clears throat> excuse me, to join the Air Force, I knew I needed to learn English. <laughs> that would be helpful. <laughs> and so uh, part of my testimony with, with, uh, with the ministry of Brother Copeland is that uh, uh, when, when that happened, I made a decision that I wanted to learn English, but I wanted to learn it with the Word of God. Wow. And, and I read one, in the crusade that I went, I read a book of Brother Copeland, and when I read it, I, I really liked it. I wrote to KCM. They sent me some tapes. So, you know, tapes, they don't make those anymore. <laughs> and so I had tapes, and I was putting them in my car, and I was listening to them. And as I listened to the Word of God, it began to do something in me. And, and I, I honestly can say that the first few tapes, I had no idea what Brother Copeland was saying. But I'm sure my spirit was catching it. And so after a period of time doing that, right before I came into service, the Lord already was changing me, changing my mind, changing the way I heard. And after my boot camp time and the other training that you, you do, I was speaking English. Fluently, reading and doing everything that I needed to do. And the other thing that happened was that after the years, you know, when the anointing of God begins to flow in a certain area, it keeps flowing if you let it. And so what happened there was that after several years, I began to, I began to you know, do my career. And, and with the Air Force, you get to travel. You get to go to different places. And by the grace of God, I went to, you know, Japan and many other countries. And in, uh, we went to Italy uh, my last three years in the Air Force. And the Lord really taught me Italian in one year. Wow. Read, write, speak, wow. and everything. What, what am I saying? The integrity of the Word of God is such that it doesn't matter what you, where you go, what you do. If you put it to work, it will do what He said it's going to do. Amen? Amen. 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 Part of the evening allows me to ask a question. And I would just like to ask you, brother, in your own words, how does God's Word represent His integrity? And just sum it up for us. Well, if God, it, the Word of God says that who God is, correct? So it tells us who He is. It tells us what He does. And it tells us how, how He behaves. What the Word of God says, He is. What the Word of God says, He does. And what the Word of God says, how He conducts Himself, that's who He is. That's what He does. And that's how He conducts Himself. 
Amen. He is his word. Thank you, sir. Amen. Praise God. Give him a hand. Hallelujah. Well, we have another distinguished panelist joining us tonight. You know her as Mrs. Aubrey Oaks. She has worked here at EMIC on full-time staff member for five years, and she has been a part of the EMIC congregation for 27 years. <laughs> <laughs> Aubrey graduated from ORU with a major in vocal performance, and she is married to Mr. Cody Oaks, sitting right over here. <laughs> and they married three months after her graduation. They will have been married for five years this year, as a matter of fact, praise God. And you have two beautiful daughters, Eileen and Kaylin. Thank you, ma'am. Something that Jaime started talking about, which really sparked my interest actually on this second, the second portion of this message, was talking about when God created, he put faith into existence. He didn't just, he didn't create this universe by mind power. He didn't create this universe by um, some kind of natural power, a mind or a soulish power, but it was done by the spirit, a spirit force. What is that spirit for us? That's faith. He didn't sit there and blink his eyes and snap his fingers, and we now have Pluto. It happened because of faith. It happened because he spoke. The spirit attached itself to his word, and it created. Are you following me? So what we said that that spirit that it created the universe is faith. What is faith? Well, we know what that is. It's the substance. So when God spoke, what was the substance? Sometimes you think of substance as something tangible. That substance was his word. That substance was the faith. What, what faith, what substance did he use to put you into existence? He, by faith, created you. He had trust that he needed you. He had trust that if this person is born, there is a reason for their existence. And that is why, by faith, you have to recognize and never doubt your existence. Because if, if there was doubt for your existence, he wouldn't have had faith to create you. I said I wasn't going to preach off of what my notes are saying, but I'm doing it anyway. Okay. His words were the substance, and his words never fail. This, the planet, the world that we live in, is it still moving? Yes. yes. Is it still operating? Yes. yes. Is it still functioning? Yes. 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 So does his word ever fail? No. no. The very sun, moon, and stars that he created as our light, are we still operating under that light? Yes. yes. His words never fail. From the moment that he said, light be, they never died. They are still into that existence, creating light to this very day. So the moment that you speak a word into existence, the, the moment, and it could be positive and it could be negative, it could be faith, it could be doubt, but the moment that you speak into existence is a moment that the spirit of the Lord attaches itself or the kingdom of the devil attaches itself. So how, how did God apply his faith? And that's the way that we can look at how to apply our faith. He did it by speaking, believing, and knowing that the spirit was at work. The spirit was at work for him. When you speak in faith, the spirit can do nothing else but work for you. I believe that that's a positive, positive news. Now, I was thinking about this, and I used to get made fun of in, in college all the time because I always did everything with object lessons. I grew up doing object lessons. I'm never going to get away from it. So just bear with me. But I was thinking about this today. I was thinking about if every light in this place turned off and it's pitch black. It's dark. We can't see a thing. And I just so conveniently have a flashlight and a leopard one at that in my back pocket. And I'm looking at this, and I'm feeling it, and I know I have it, and I'm, and I'm shaking this thing, and I'm telling it to come on. Have I activated the power? No. no. Well, oh, man, I don't have a battery in my flashlight. What am I going to do? Oh, I so conveniently have a battery in my left hand. So I'm shaking both of them. I'm going bananas. I'm running all over the place, trying to create light that I have in my hands. I possess the power to create light. But has it been created? No. no. But the moment that I put power 
behind this power and I turn it on, I have then activated what I have needed to see. I've needed to see power. I have activated it. So every time that you hear something, did that help you? Please tell me that it did, okay. Every time that you hear the word and you're listening and you've got, you have 15 CD series in your car and you've got all of them ready and out and you've listened to all of them 12 times by Tuesday, you watch Christian television nonstop 24 hours a day, it is going in all the time. But until you activate the power, it can't work. This is a two-way street. Faith is a two-way street. God did his job by creating you. Now you do your job by recognizing his word. And we do that by paying, we do that by meditating on his word. That's how we become successful. Every single word in this book is truth. But unless you take this word and apply it as truth, its truth is completely irrelevant. In the beginning, God set into motion the law of beginnings, which the principle of that is that whatever is planted is what is reaped. I cannot plant a peach tree and reap a plum tree. I can't, as Papa says, I cannot plant a corn plant and reap a donut. And I, <laughs> I listened to that and thought, man, I wish. That'd be awesome. <laughs> anyway, self-control. Um, so naturally speaking that, you know that we have a spirit, soul, and body. Your physical body eats physical things. What does that produce? It produces a physical strength. Your mental part, your, your mind feeds off of intellect. It feeds off of mental food. And what does that create? Well, it creates mind power. It creates, as my three-year-old well knows, willpower. But the spirit... This is where it gets obvious. The spirit feeds on spirit things. What does it create? Faith. There's your strength. Your physical body creates strength. Your mental creates power. And the spirit creates strength. But you have to feed it. You have to feed on it. You don't just hear it. What does it say? We don't, we're not just hearers only. But we do the word. You have to do the truth. You have to do the power. So every time that you speak by the Spirit, every time you feed on the Spirit, that truth and that power produces a faith which then becomes activated. That's why the word says in Matthew 4, 4, and you don't have to turn there, but it says man cannot live by what? Bread alone. I can't sit and read the dictionary and, and expect my body to be healthy if I don't feed it spiritually and naturally. But man, do I know the letter D of the dictionary. That's I can't live that way. But I've got to feed every air of my body because the Bible says that he wants to satisfy us wholly. Not H-O-L-Y, but as a whole, a complete body. You can't have one without the other. Everything that comes out of the mouth of God is faith. What comes out of your mouth? Everything that comes out of your mouth, it is faith. But faith for what? When it said you cannot live by bread alone, how, does, how do we live off of something? Well, some people say I could just live off of string cheese or cheese in a can, which I don't even understand. But some people could, I could just live off of popcorn. That I can. How do you live off of the word? How do you live on something like this? You live off of it by knowing it. You live off of it become, by falling in love with it. You live off of it by, by developing a relationship. And I don't mean the Bible itself as a relationship. You understand that the, word, the words here are not just a book that God wrote. It is God. It is Him. This encompasses Him. So when I talk about knowing the Word of God, that means knowing God. You talk about knowing love, that means knowing God. We're born of love. We're born of God. We know God. We know the Word. I, I think you get it. 
So what the way that you develop something, the way you know something is by meditating on it and putting action behind it. If I haven't eaten for days and somebody slaps a, just a giant juicy steak right in front of me, mashed potatoes, vegetables, if it was Cody, he'd cover them cheese, a nice perfectly crispy roll, I've got it all sitting in front of me and I haven't eaten, I'm starving. And I sit there and I think as hard as I can about eating that food. Does it satisfy me? No. What does it take to satisfy an action? It takes picking up the fork, putting it in your mouth, chewing it, and swallowing it. If you take the word, you pick it up, and you put it in your mouth, and you chew on it, but you don't swallow it, it does not have the ability to distribute nutrients to your body. Deuteronomy 30, 19 says to choose life. That is an action that the Lord has put in front of us. And when you can't get enough of what the word says, that's when it becomes alive. And death is overtaken by life, sickness is overtaken by healing, and poverty is overtaken by prosperity. But you make it alive and you make it truth by putting your eyes on it. And the, the personal testimony for me in that is, um, you know, recently we've dealt with a lot of sickness and a lot of attacks on our body. Um, and my little, my little Eileen started showing some symptoms. And I, you know, my first initial thought was, Cody's gone, I'm working, I do not have time for sickness. I mean, I was pretty mad at the devil and he's seen me snap a few times. So I'm sitting there and I'm just, I'm telling Eileen, we're not doing this. We're not gonna have it this way. And I'm quoting my scriptures and man, I'm feeling strong. I'm feeling powerful until the Lord said, have you, have you looked at the word? Yeah, Lord, I know exactly what it says. I know what's mine. I take it by faith. I have my healing. I have Eileen's healing. We're not dealing with this. Devil, you take your hands off of Eileen. She is a child of God. Have you looked at the word? Yes, Jesus, I know exactly what your word says. I read it last week. I know exactly what it says. I don't need to, I don't need to, oh, I get it. So I took, I took the scriptures, and even though Eileen can't read, she can see. And it's planting seeds, and we laid our eyes on it, and by the time that evening was over, that child was healed, whole, and made well. But what did it take to activate the power? It took putting action behind it and putting your eyes on the truth. Almost. Great examples and great personal examples as well. I have a question for you. We talked a little bit before with Jaime and with you about what the word holds together. Mm -hmm. What does it separate us from? John, yeah, John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by your truth your word is truth. And my uh, reference over here, sanctify also means to be set apart. The word sets us apart. When we meditate on it and we read it and it gets inside of us, it sets you apart from the kingdom of, of darkness. It sets you apart from your past and it sets you apart to him. Amen. When you become unified with the kingdom of God, that's the separate, it's the unity with God and it's the separation from the world. Hallelujah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Please give her a hand. <laughs> well, our next distinguished panelist is Dr. Daphne Singleton. Daphne is currently a training specialist here at the Partner Service Center uh, at Kenneth Copeland Ministries. She's also a member of the very first graduating class of Kenneth Copeland Scholars. And this is, she actually earned her doctorate in ministry. Praise God. She and her husband, Joseph, have been partners with KCM for over 20 years and have been uh, members of EMIC for nearly five years. She's been an instructor for the Believers Institute over several years, and we appreciate her. So would you give her a hand as she comes? Praise God. <laughs> Integrity of the Word, Part 3. Now, she didn't say she was a Copeland, and she couldn't stop. And we were talking early, and I said, well, I'm a Kenneth Copeland scholar, so can I use that as an example? Because his anointing is on me as well. But I want to thank, thank Dr. Tony for, for selecting us and selecting me to do this. It's an honor to speak before you. I have a couple of questions to start with. What kind of person are you? And after you leave tonight, I want you to think about these questions that I'm asking. 
What kind of person do you want to be? Sometimes we have an idea of who we are, what we want to be, and there's a big gap there, and there's a hole there. But I want to ask you, what is your purpose in life? What are you here for? What's your ministry? What's your passion? What's your vocation? And in all of that, are you speaking words that will lift you up in that vocation, in that passion? What are you speaking? We're talking about the word. Jaime began to define integrity, and I just knew I was going to have to move page one over and just start with page two. But when we define integrity, one of the sources said, integrity is a concept of consistency of actions, values, methods, principles, expectations, and outcomes. In ethics, integrity is regarded as the honesty and truthfulness or accuracy of one's action. Integrity can be regarded as the opposite of dishonesty and hypocrisy, in that integrity regards internal consistency as a virtue. Being a math major, that integer part was something that I was interested in as well. He mentioned an integer being a whole number per se, but an integer also means complete, being whole, nothing missing, nothing broken. Let's break it down spiritually. Nothing missing, nothing broken, complete in him. Oh, glory. Synonyms, character, decency, goodness, honesty, morality, righteousness, rightness, uprightness, and virtue. Jesus paid it all, didn't he? He took my debt your debt and paid it in full. Nothing else needs to be paid. Therefore, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us that, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Y'all are so good. The believer, that's you and I, we've been born again by the Word of God. It is His creative power through the Word of God that brings into existence a new species of being. That's at the time of your new birth. It was His Word that created the universe. And they tell me light is still traveling. When he spoke, it was. In Genesis, it says, when he said, light be, it was. When everything he said, it became. I ask you, what are you speaking into being? Yes, words are containers. Yes, they hold faith and fear in our hands. Which do you choose? Faith, fear. Things that make you go, hmm. What are you speaking? What are you saying? I ask you. When Jesus was tempted, he responded by saying, it is written. When you are tempted, <laughs> what are you saying? It is written. Praise God. Is that speaking by faith? Amen. All of us. Praise God. Glory to God. It is written. The Word of God is an incorruptible seed that lives and abides forever. That Word of God is Christ. When you're speaking the Word of God, you're speaking into being Christ Himself in us, the hope of glory. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. That's what's in me. He is. The Word is. And when you meditate on it, you spend time day and night on that Word, it becomes a part of you. It becomes who you are. You're trying to be like Christ. He's our example. That word in you is our hope of glory. That's what we're putting inside of us. My, my, my. John 17, 15, 
Jesus looked up to heaven and he was talking to the Father and he says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them, talking about us as believers, don't take them out of this world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil in this world. Jesus was praying for us. He was praying that we would live here, but not be affected by evil. He lived here. Do you think evil affected him? He's our example, right? When things come up, that's when we speak the word. That's when we remember Jesus and remember that everything I do, I wanted to give him glory. Everything I say, I wanted to give him glory. Everything that Je Jesus said, everything that I say, it's because I've heard my father say it. Well, that's what I want to do. I want to say those things that the father said. I want to do those things that Jesus did. He even said, greater works than these shall you do. Who glory. Let me get back to my text. Who glory. But as believers, we are to walk above evil, not beneath. The blessing of the Lord, when Jesus paid it all, he gave us back that Garden of Eden experience. That's what we should be experiencing. Well, we can walk above that evil and not beneath. You remember what the blessing says is in Deuteronomy 28? I'm blessed in the city, I'm blessed in the field, I'm blessed coming in, blessed going out, I'm above and not beneath. Right? That's where we are. We're not beneath the evil, we're above it. I collect eagles and, 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 and you know, eagle, and this is not on my script, but eagles fly above the storm. They go in and fly above it. How many eaglets do I see out there? Amen. Glory to God. Whatever you're dealing with, no, no. I know we believe, but if you heard Jesse and Brother Copeland this morning, he talked about, yeah, we believe, we believe, we believe, but it's time we know. We got to know and know in our knower without a shadow of a doubt what this word says. Stand on it, believe it, and expect it. Creflo talks about next stretching expectancy. Someone's coming over, you know they're coming at 3 o'clock, 2.55, you're looking out the door. Next stretching expectancy, right? What are you expecting? What are you speaking? What are you speaking for you to expect? Glory to God. Glory to God. Verse 18 of John 17, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so I sent them. Christ has sent us. We are his disciples. What are we sharing with the world? What do people see when they see you? What do people interpret from your body language? What do people interpret from your facial expression? What do they see in you? Do they see Christ in you? I'm going to leave that part alone right now and keep on my notes. <laughs> Glory to God. God is a just God, and he would not give this authority without the power to pull down strongholds. The key is the quality decision to put the word of God first and allow it to be final authority in your life. The word works. That's the name of our bookstore. The word works. Try it. If you don't believe me, try it. Didn't he say, prove me and see won't I? He wants us to prove him. He wants us to stand on his word. He wants us to say, I am healed. With his stripes, I am healed. He wants us to talk about being prosperous. He wants us to be an example. We don't go by what we see. We don't go by what that checkbook says. We don't go by how we feel. We speak the word of God and walk in faith. We speak the word of God and walk in faith. You can talk about revealed knowledge, and we can talk about sense knowledge. I don't know about you, but I stopped listening to my five senses. I stopped listening to them because they only tell me soulish stuff. They only tell me stuff that really doesn't line up with the Word of God. That revealed knowledge is with me, with the, with the Holy Spirit inside me, it touches with my heart. It shares with me God's heart through his word in my spirit so that in any situation I know what I am to do. I know where I am to go. I know what I am to say. As part of my testimony and my husband, I didn't say how many years, but this year we'll get 29 years. My husband of 29 years, thank you for coming tonight. He can tell you as my testimony, he can, he can share with you and tell you when I was growing up, I would speak anything and say anything, whatever came up would come out. And I felt like everybody wanted to know Daphne's opinion. <laughs> I felt
found out otherwise. <laughs> but I learned the vocabulary of silence until I got to a point where I could stand on God's word and speak God's word and, and, st and stand on it and believe it and know that it would come to pass in my life. Yeah. So my testimony is you can do the same. If you don't like where you are, change directions. Speak the word, speak that difference into your own life. Praise God. I better stop while I'm ahead, brother. You're on fire. Woo, glory. Mm. Glory to God. Daphne, while you're on fire, I thought of this question as you said it yourself. There is a difference between sense knowledge and revelation knowledge, and you touched on it. Yes. Explain the difference just in a summary. In a summary. Your, 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 your sense knowledge is based on your senses. It's based on your feelings. I think, I feel, I think, I feel, what you think and what you feel. We don't walk by that. We walk by faith. That's revealed knowledge because we have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Mm -hmm. And we know with faith, we can do anything. We can do all things. But with faith, that revealed knowledge from the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you if you let it. If you're listening. But that revealed knowledge comes from the Holy Spirit. And that's what we need to be listening to more than anything else. More than what that letter from IRS says. More than what your bank statement says. More than how you're feeling. More than the aches and pains. More than what the doctor says. More than that doctor's report. That's sense knowledge. That's the doctor's report. But God's word says, I am healed with his stripes, with Jesus' stripes. What he, what he stood for there on Calvary keeps me from what I have to go through with now. We're putting up with too much of Satan's stuff. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. We got to move on. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Daphne. Praise the Lord. Well, we have another young man who I also refer to as one of our original super kids, Mr. Blake Sturm. He has grown up here at EMIC. He's grown up through our Super Kid Academy. He's been a part of our 1440 program, and now he's still a part of our young adults group. Blake is a manager at Tom Thumb, even at his young age. You're also a Believer's Institute instructor, and we are privileged to hear from you, sir. Yes, sir. Although Please. I have no problem, doctor. If you'd like to keep going, <laughs> you're more than welcome to. I can tell. I got my pen. I'll take notes. All right. I can run that risk. That was good. Well, I'm here to talk about the miracle action of the Word of God, part one. And I'll be very transparent. When I first heard that we were doing this, I was kind of excited because I, I, I kind of had to jump on everyone else, at least I'm, I think so. I'd actually come across this series about a year ago. And so I had, had it on my phone, and every now and again I've been playing through it. So in my mind, I'm th I found out what we're doing. I'm like, great, you know, this is going to be quick. I'm going to jump in. I, I know what I'm going to want to talk about. I couldn't know where I was going. Um, and when you're 22 and you feel like you know something, that's a big deal, Okay. <laughs> I'm just being real transparent here. I found out real quick that if I think I know something, probably don't. And surprise, I got into it, and Brother Copeland and Jesus Christ then took me to school again. But it was good. I was excited because his main scripture used was from Joshua. And I'm actually having you, have you turn there. It's Joshua chapter 1. And I love Joshua. I mean, talk about a man of God that in, in the face of a generation that was turning from God... He had the guts to stand up and say, I believe there's something better for us. And that's a powerful statement for me as a young adult and for any of us in the body of Christ. In the midst of generations that are more so now than at any other time in history saying, I there's other ways to believe. There's other things to do. And, and we have to stand strong and be like, no, 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 no. We've heard from the Lord. And that's what Joshua was doing. And in Joshua uh, chapter 1, verse 7, uh, the Lord is talking to Joshua and he says, Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law. What's the first thing he tells them to do? Observe to do all according to the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. And I'm going to tell you something real quick. I'm going to stop. And this is, this is groundbreaking. You've never heard it before. 
There's two things you got to do when it comes to wanting to see the miracle action of God in your life. You got to study the word. You got to speak the word. Sound new? Nope. Because if you've been in here for about 20 minutes, you've already heard that. It's kind of a big deal around here. So let's go back. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. For have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now show of hands, how many of us have ever come to church? I'm talking about six minutes, okay. How many of us have ever come to church? Shouting service. I mean, everyone's just bouncing. It, it, it hit home. You walk out those doors, the whole drive over. Man, church was awesome. The word of God it was in me. And, it was, and, and just the whole way. And then Monday morning hits, and you can't remember a thing. Anybody ever have that happen? <laughs> Again, 22, learning these things. And guess what? It happens. It would have been very easy for Joshua to do that very same thing. It would have been very easy to walk out of this and go back in front of millions, millions of Jews and be like, um, okay, guys, we're supposed to be over there, so what's the plan? Maybe we can, we can build a bridge across the Jordan. We'll build a bridge, take a couple weeks, we can come back. Um, listen, we're going to wait about 10 more years. We'll come back, we'll have the army together, we can get over, we can do what God's wanting us to do. But, you know, it's going to take some time, we're going to do it this way. But that's not what he said. He heard the word. He had 40 years leading up to this to prepare. This is what separated Joshua apart from everyone else. 40 years. And instead of moping and complaining and doing what the rest of the generation did, which was die off, he said, nuh uh, I still remember. I still remember looking into that land and remembering what God promised me. And what happened? He walked away from that moment with God. He walked away from that moment of hearing the word of the Lord. And instead of going back and trying to figure out in his head, what was, what should we do? What should we do? What should we do? All he did was repeat exactly what he heard. And he said, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the camp and command the people, saying, prepare provisions for yourself, for within three days you will cross over this Jordan, whether we got to go under it, over it, through it, split it across, do whatever he's got to do. We will cross the Jordan, go in and possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. And guess what happened? From that point, Lear said, you know what, Joshua, you're absolutely right. We've been praying for this moment, too. Whatever the Lord tells you to do, we will, they tell him later on. As, as he was with Moses, he was with you. Let's go tell him. Okay. And later on in chapter 3, they cross the Jordan, and he still keeps going. He goes until back to Lear and says, look, guys, this is in chapter 3. He said, you go tell the people, prepare themselves right now, because tomorrow morning... Breakthrough is happening right now. We're going to witness another miracle. And you know what they said? Okay, let's go, let's go. Why? Because they were choosing to receive the word. Brother Copeland said that the word will build a capacity for faith. But your words are what put it into action. Your words are what activate it. I like this. He said, we must act on the word as if every word began with your name. The other scripture you used was uh, Isaiah chapter 55. I'll go through it real quick. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, that's the word. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven. Now we're getting over into believing. And do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud. What? He said, you got you Listen. You got to take the word, and you got to trust it the same way you trust that that cloud over there is going to bring rain. It's going to water that plant. That plant's going to it's going to hit the seed. The seed's going to grow, and suddenly you're going to have a plant right there. That it may give the seed to the sower and bread to the either. So shall my word be that goes from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So you know what? I took exactly what Brother Copeland said, and I took that as if my name was in that. So shall God's word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to him void, but it shall accomplish what he pleases. 
and I shall prosper in the thing for which he sent me. That's a difference. There's a difference there. There's a difference when you look at scriptures like this and you, and, and you, you, know, you go over to Ephesians and suddenly it's not um, I, I strengthen through, uh, uh, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. No, 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 no. I can do all things through Christ, the anointing that resides on the very inside of me. The same anointing that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is on the inside of me. And with that, I can do all things through him. You start talking like that, I'm expecting something now. I thought I knew something. Now I know something. I was trying to think of a way to put I got a minute 20. Okay, I'm doing good. I was trying to think of a way to, to, to describe this that honestly made sense to me. And I was reminded, uh, how many of you ever took biology in high school? Raise hands. How many of you just love biology in high school? Put your hand down. <laughs> Couldn't remember nothing from that class. And I remember the first quarter of, of my biology freshman class, we had to know the word osmosis. And I couldn't, you know, I knew it was important. It was biology. And outside of cutting a few pigs open, I wasn't that interested. But, you know, she just had to put on every single test. And the more you missed it, the more the points she got off. It was like 20 points of the test. And you're like, okay, I don't get it. You know, it was just thing, a thing in the textbook. So you know what she did one day? She pulled me aside. Blake, come here. Mrs. Ligon. She pulled me aside and for 40 minutes explained to me, using two containers and a sandwich, what osmosis meant. I don't know how she did it. I don't remember anything about it. That was seven years ago. But you know what I do remember? Osmosis is the movement of water molecules from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration through a semi-permeable membrane. Don't ask me to explain it beyond that, but guess what? Seven years later, I still remember it. Why? Why? What happened? I never missed it on her test either. Because it went from something that was just in a book that w to something that was vital to my success. And the moment I recognized it as that, it clicked and I never missed it again. That very thing that, is, that you're struggling with, that you're having a hard time with, a lot of times we think a miracle is just in the body. If it's a physical thing, find the word. Find the word, make it personal, speak it out of your mouth. I don't care if somebody asks you, you feeling sick? You know what? No, not according to this. I learned real quick when I'm at work, and you're working with a bunch of people that don't believe the word, and they're all coughing and hacking and sneezing, and I feel sick, and I don't feel good, and I need to go home. I'm not going home. I'm not going to give them the benefit of that. I remember about six months ago, everyone was coughing, sneezing, when the flu was kind of winding down, and I started coughing. Somebody's like, oh, you're getting sick. I turned around, five minutes. Give me five minutes, I'll be right back. Why? Because I had parents that put me in that chair right over there from the time I was 11 years old. And because the faith of God enlarged my capacity to grow. And now as a young man, I know exactly how to handle that situation. And from this, guess what? Now i got to learn to take what I know there and translate it into everything else in my life. And the moment we do that, that's when we'll see the miracle power of God in our lives. Amen? Nice job. Well, I really like the way you talked about making the word real, personal, mm -hmm. intimate. You described Isaiah 55, and yep. I believe that does a fine job of it. So let me ask you this question. How is the word of God compared to something, say, like a will? Well, the thing with a will is it's as real and it's as um, active and it's as important the day it's read as the day it was written. Amen. The key is... Somebody has to be there when it comes to speak the will. And until then, there's no power in it. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, sir. Give him a hand. Praise God. That's why we call them super kids. Praise God. How would you like to meet the mother of that young firecracker? <laughs> Mrs. Gayla Sturm is our next guest. And... Uh, she is right here, that's right. You know, since 1997, Jim and Gayla Sturm have called EMIC their base camp. They consider it spiritual training for the Sturm household. 
This family has had the privilege to serve in many different areas of EMIC as well as different KCM events. You've primarily grown up serving on the music team here, and that means choir and gym and the ensemble and so forth. You have three children, Blake, Keely, and Micah, and you have also homeschooled for nearly 18 years, and you are also currently a challenge director with Classical Conversations Incorporated, which assists other homeschooling families. Thank you, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yeah. Aha. There we go. Okay, we'll visit later. Let's just jump right in the word. This is Miracle Action, part two. Chapter five in your study guide. CD five, if you prefer it on audio. There's a little quote here I want to read before I start. Fear activates Satan the way faith activates God. But you can drive out doubt and fear. You can think and act just like God. And you will receive a miracle when you hold fast to the confession of your faith. Simon and his brother Andrew were the first among the disciples to be chosen. I think Simon was 22. He was headstrong, he was a fisherman, a manly man. He struggled with anger and pride and impulsiveness. But Jesus saw something and said, follow me. In Matthew 16, the disciples are walking along the beach one day and Jesus turns to each one of them and he says, who do men say that I am? And they gave various answers. A few minutes later, he turned to Simon and he said, who do you say I am? Simon said, you're the Christ, son of the living God. Jesus said, you are Peter. And you did not get this on your own. The Spirit of God has revealed it to you. Oh, he got it right. <laughs> he must have been so happy. And Jesus says, don't tell anybody. <laughs> Then Jesus goes on to begin to tell the disciples of events to come. He's going to prep them for the crucifixion. Simon is agitated. He's moved. He pulls Jesus aside and starts to argue with him. This man who just heard from the Spirit of God is now arguing with Jesus. And Jesus says... Get behind me, Satan. Where are Simon's thoughts? Or was it Peter's thoughts? The great thing about Peter, he never quit following. He was aware of where he missed it. It was Peter that eventually denied even knowing Jesus. Imagine the memories and the thoughts he had to live with. But even after the crucifixion, Peter is found in the company of the disciples. He never left his assembly. He never quit. He never quit. He continued to study the Torah... He continued to read the words of the prophets. He continued to think the word. He continued to think of his times with Jesus. And somewhere between the crucifixion of Christ and the first chapter of Acts, Peter and the Holy Spirit got alone with each other. <laughs> and he learned to connect some dots. Here's a statement from Brother Copeland that changed my life. You'll want to write this down, trust me. And it's this. Apart from the word, in any given situation, is to be without God. Somewhere Peter realized 
that with Jesus he could do anything. It was Peter that ushered in the miracles of the first church. But Peter also realized that apart from Jesus, in his old nature, in that nature of Simon, in his fallenness, not only could he do nothing, but he possessed the capacity to do the devil's work for him. When it comes time for Peter to write his experiences with Jesus, he opens up the first book in the first line, and he says, I, Peter. He doesn't address himself as Simon. He calls himself what Jesus called him. It's Peter over in chapter 5 that reminds us to humble ourselves, to be ready to have a word for people that want to know about the hope inside you. It's Peter that reminds us to cast your cares. Peter. When I first began walking with the Lord, I had to come face to face with my own failures, with my own sin. The devil will beat you over the head with past failures. The moment you make the decision to follow Jesus, you have a battle. And it starts in your own head. You can't fight thoughts with thoughts. You can only fight thoughts with the word. So how do you do it? Because until you win the battle of the mind, you can't win the battle of the mouth. You can't win the battle of the motives. And you won't win the battle of the method or your walk. It won't line up until you win it here first. You have to start by calling yourself what Jesus has called you. And you won't know that until you get in the Word. I might add that when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John refer to Peter, when you study out his life, several times in the Gospels they will refer to the disciples and Peter as if he wasn't one of them. I wonder if they expected him to be the one to betray Jesus. Do people misunderstand you? Do you not fit in? Are you struggling with sin? Don't quit. Don't quit. You stay in church. You stay in church. And if you need both services, you stay for both services. That would be me. Because when I have to set out to battle things in my own body, if I need to battle for my children, if I'm standing next to the bed in the, of my, my husband's hospital bed, I need power. I don't need sweet words. I need power. There's no power apart from the word. To be in any given situation without the word is to be without God. So for me, I started journaling because when I'm in a battle, and especially if it's in your mind, this is overwhelming. So you have to prepare for battle ahead of time. Because in the battle, I know my makeup. I'm not going to go dig through this. So I need to organize my arsenal. Thank the Lord there are some godly men and women that went before me that have given me some amazing tools. Amen. Are you struggling with knowing who you are? There's a little book in our bookstore by Brother Hagen. It's about this big called In Him. There's over a hundred scriptures in there that will tell you who you are in God. Healing, fear, sexual sins. There's a concordance in the back of every single Bible. You can start there. I have a separate journal that's just healing scriptures. So when someone calls or I need to go somewhere or I'm fighting in my own body, I pull out this and I pull out what's already been proven. My journal. 
I have my words that have worked for me and I'm willing to add to it. Lord, show me where it's at. And I'll add this. When my body is in pain, when symptoms are coming against my head and I have a headache, I don't feel like reading. So I also have two items on my phone, my iPad, my computer, and two CDs on my shelf. Because some word is getting in here somehow, some way. If you got to turn it on to get yourself to pray in tongues before you can even pick up your journal and fight, then you do what you got to do. It's a battle. These are my fighting scriptures. Sometimes I use a journal. Sometimes I want something smaller because this fits in my purse. Because sometimes the fight is minute by minute. So you write it down. You find one or two friends. You don't tell everybody your business, but you find one or two friends that you know know the word. And you, you get, get yourself some scriptures. So when I'm fighting, let's see what I do. Proverbs 19.11. A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is his glory to overlook an offense. Are you offended? Are you mad? Are things not going your way? Disappointed in people? A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. This is a no offense zone. So I've taken the word. Now I'm going to make it my own. My choice is to overlook offenses. It requires crossing over into the supernatural. It's a privilege to be chosen to be godly. I prize the intimacy and fellowship with the Father more than I desire to see my enemies punished. And then it took all these other scriptures to get me past. And there's blank ones in the back because I'm still adding to it, but it's thick. Can you see? But this is 10 years. 10 years, and I probably have half a dozen journals. But that's how I get it in. This is my armory. But you'll get miracles and signs and wonders. Jesus said signs will follow his word. And Jesus said greater works than he did will do. I'm not there yet, but I'm working on it. Amen. That was real. <laughs> to say the least. But, you know, you, you talked about making the word personal as well. And we know that the word can change our circumstances. It can change our lives. It's active. It's alive. It's sharper than any, any two-edged sword. So let me ask you this. Our pastors have said this many times, but what do they mean by activating the word for yourself in prayer? It means that I'm sitting at my dining room table and I'm going to pray to the Lord that I can put the word before him. I can take my name and put it in these scriptures. It's Gala's wisdom that gives her pay, or it's God's wisdom that gives Gala patience. It's the glory to overlook an offense. I can go on and on. It's all throughout here. And you just insert your name and make it a part of your prayer. That you will look like him. That you will speak like him. You will see things like him. You will understand things like him. Um, behold, Gala, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure Gala. Yeah. You just put your name in there and make it personal. Thank you. Hallelujah. Give her a hand. Praise God. Well, we have one last distinguished panelist, Mr. Stephen Wilson. He is a graduate of Victory Bible Institute, and he is also a staff member here at KCM. He's been a member of EMIC since uh, 2000. It says 2013, brother, I believe. Thank you. I knew it was longer than that. <laughs> he has been involved in our traffic team, altar prayer ministry, new believer follow-up, and he also currently leads a men-only prayer group, and you're also one of our BI instructors. Thank you, sir. Amen. Well, good evening, sons and daughters of God. 
I want to remind you who you are. I'm uh, covering the last disc in the, um, the CD set. It's on, on uh, acting on the word, or I'm going to call it uh, keeping it real, when the rubber meets the road. And there's four points that came out in this disc that I wanted to share with you. The first one has to do with integrity. You know, and it's really interesting if you listen to every single person that spoke up here, the Holy Spirit has a common thread that he's tying throughout this message. You know, and, and integrity is directly correlated to the character of the person. If you don't know the character of the person, you cannot have faith in their integrity. Jesus said in John chapter 17 that this is eternal life, that they would know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ who him sent. It's a personal relationship. And how do you get to know somebody you can't see? Well, he gave us a word, and he gave us the Holy Spirit to live inside of us, the spirit of truth. You cannot trust God unless you trust his integrity. The second point has to do with knowledge. You have to know what God spoke before you can have faith in it. You know, Brother Copeland tells a story. He says, you know, I'll use him as an example. If Brother Copeland, if I say Brother Copeland said he'll pay your mortgage payment, that sounds great. But the first question you need to ask yourself is, is did Brother Copeland really say that? If he didn't say that, you better figure out how to come up with your mortgage. If he did say it, you can hold him to it, because he's a man of his word. You have to take time to establish yourself in the word of God. And the best time to do that is before the storms hit and before the rain's coming. Because the last thing you want to be doing is being stuck in a storm and your foundation is washing away. And now you're having to deal with the stress and the pressure of the storm and you're trying to put yourself back together. In the CD series, Brother Copeland says that God will bring the miracles in your storm, in the midst of your storm. But you have to understand, he's only going to bring those miracles based on his word and based on his spirit and based on his truth. So if you're in the middle of a storm right now, and I've been there, and I'm going to talk about that in my testimony, then you need to make sure the first place you go, like she said, is you need to personalize scriptures and you need to get your eyes on it. And you need to keep your eyes on that word. But miracles are not God's best manner. It's not his, his ideal way of changing your life. What he's really wanting you to do is act like a son of God. What he's wanting you to do is to take his word, fellowship with him in the spirit. It becomes rhema. It comes living word inside of you. And you start walking in the wisdom of God. God said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Well, guess what? He gave you his thoughts. The question is, are you sticking them in your head? The third point has to do with understanding. You, when you make a quality decision to walk and base your life on the Word of God, the first thing you need to understand is that opposition is coming. Satan cannot afford for you to get a revelation of who you are because then he is done. And so with that, he's going to bring trials and he's going to bring persecution and he's going to bring pressure on your life. And he's going to turn up that pressure and he's going to turn up that heat and you got to get that word down inside of you. And, and when I talk about this pressure, there's two reasons why in, in this series, Brother Copeland says, why people fail in a trial. Number one, they get their eyes off their word. They start looking at other things. And it's easy, man. When you're dealing with stuff, you're dealing with stuff in your body, you're dealing with your finances, you're tired, you're physically tired. The last thing that you want to do is get in the Word. But you've got to pray in the Holy Ghost. You've got to make yourself get in the Word and turn off outside influences. And if you'll do that, what will happen is, is you'll start getting the Word inside of your heart. 
Because really where the force of faith comes is when you take your trust in God and you take the Word of God and you put it at the core of your being, it connects with God's faith and it begins to build a force inside of you and it builds and it builds and it builds and it becomes a rhema word of God and all of a sudden it gets released and things start changing in your life. The second reason why people fail is that they fail to protect their heart from mental ascent. Well, what is mental ascent? I struggled with faith for a long time. Okay, am I in faith? Am I in not faith? I don't know if I'm in faith. Help me. Well, here's mental, here's mental ascent. Mental ascent will say, I believe that this is the Word of God. I believe that what these statements are, that they are true. But the way that I act and what I speak is contrary to this. That's mental ascent. It's mental power. Yes, I believe it. Yes, I believe it. But you know what? In the middle of a battle, the enemy is going to wear you down because he's going to come and he's going to come and he's going to come and he's going to come. And eventually you're going to get tired in your mind and then it's over. Mental ascent never acts it just agrees that the word is true. But you can get to a point where if you'll just be consistent, as Sister Gloria says, in consistency lies the power, where you just, you get in the word, you turn off outside influences, you get it in front of your eyes and you just meditate on it and you speak it and you speak it and you personalize it and you meditate and you speak it. Oh yeah, and you pray in tongues. Because the mystery of this will get unlocked when you pray in tongues. It'll, be, it'll start talking to you when you wake up in the morning. It'll start talking to you at lunch. So I share all this because the Lord wanted me to be really transparent and talk about my testimony. Five years ago, I came to an end of myself. I was at a point I had found a lot of success in the sales industry. I had made a lot of money. But through pride, through bitterness, I was in a really bad spot financially. I was in a bad spot physically. I was dealing with stuff in my body. Went to three doctors and a specialist, wasn't getting any answers, had four allergic reactions to medication. I dealt with a year and a half, I dealt with the thought of dying all the time. All the time. I'd wake up, it was on my mind. It was on my mind during the day. I'm thinking about my family. I'm thinking, what are you going to do? These thoughts come in. What are you going to do? What's your wife going to do? What's your daughter going to do? Did you, you didn't fulfill anything in your life. You didn't do anything. Let me tell you something. That's not a good place to be. And why am I being so transparent? Because the Lord said that there's people here right now that need to hear this. Because you're just like in Ezekiel chapter 37, in verse 11. It says, God's talking to Ezekiel, it says, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, and they say our bones are dried. Our hope is lost, and we are cut off for our parts. There are people in here that you've been standing and you've been dealing with stuff, and you're wondering if it's going to come to pass. I was at a point in 2009 when I was in my closet, and I was this close to telling God to go fly to kite. And I was born again, spirit filled. But you know what? Pride will destroy you. Sin will kill you. And the enemy is going to keep taking you a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. And the battle is for your mind. You got to understand it's in your thought life. And he'll insert stuff all day long until you start realizing and recognizing it's the enemy that's attacking you. You're under an attack. I dealt with physical symptoms in my body. I was at work several times. I'm in pain. I literally had to sit in my office and get out the word and go to Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O soul, you're going to bless the Lord. And all that's within me, within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. This is when I have pain going through my head, down my back, into my ear, excruciating pain. I'm taking medicine. Who forgives all your iniquities? Who heals all your diseases? Every disease, every sickness, every infirmity. He redeems my life from destruction. 
corruption, death, and the grave. He crowns me with loving kindness. He surrounds me at all times with His faithful covenant love and tender mercies. He satisfies my mouth with good things so that my youth is renewed like the eagles. My youth is renewed like the eagles. My flesh is stronger than in my youth. And I have returned to the days of my youthful vigor. But you got to get that inside of you. Because there's going to be pressure and pressure and pressure and pressure and pressure and pressure. And the Word is what's going to uphold you in the middle of that. And let me tell you something. I was at a point where I had lost my marriage, alienated my daughter. I was going to lose everything. My marriage is restored. My relationship with my daughter is back. God's putting stuff back together for me financially. He's taken a lot of stuff out of my body. My body would still tell me I still can't hear on my left ear, but it's a lie because I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. And I'm here to tell you right now, the last part of Ezekiel 37... I'm speaking this to you who are standing right now and you're wondering if God's going to pull you through this. Thus prophesy and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, I will cause you to come out of your graves, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. That's the promised land. And you shall know that I am the Lord, and when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit inside of you, and you shall live. And I shall place you in your own land, and then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it, I have performed it, says the Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. And for the sake of time, and the yes. sake of our nursery workers, I will skip your question. Thank you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now that was good. Thank you for teaching us how to stand on the Word. Hallelujah. Well, tonight you've gotten a wide variety of perspective. And I tell you, it, it really helps when we hear from people just like you and me, people that apply the Word differently to different circumstances and situations. And this is what makes a difference. This is what changes the course from negative to positive, from darkness to light. What a pleasure we have to have all of you and to have all of them in this church. Praise God. Would you give them all a hand? Well, if you wouldn't mind, please stand with me, and we're going to be dismissed in just a moment. If you have children at any of the nursery areas or down the hill, please go and get them right away so that our folks can get a good night's sleep tonight. Praise God. I want to pray over you tonight as we go and just bless you. If anyone has a need or an issue, I'll ask our, our prayer ministers to come forward here tonight. Don't leave church the same way you came. That's my favorite quote. It's mine. You can quote it. That's okay. But you should never leave church the same way you came. It's an opportunity to go to a new level and to be transformed. It's the Word of God working. And I believe that's what's happening in you right now. Bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you for every one of our congregation members. I thank you, Lord, that you are doing a new work, a mighty work in the midst of each of their lives. I thank you that as they go forth throughout this week, the remainder of this week, Lord, they are a light to those that need it most, that they take this Word that they've received tonight and that they share it that it becomes salty, and they become salty, Lord. I thank you for them. I thank you that they are blessed, and everything they set their hand to, it does prosper. We give you glory for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You are dismissed. Hello.